Good evening, everyone. My name is Nick. To those of you who do not know me, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get cracking. If your phone isn't on silent, please make sure that it is on silent going forward. Now, by way of introduction, I want to give you a little bit of an analogy. Now, in the mid to early 90s, when I was still a young boy, I was receiving, much like many of you would have, a small allowance from my parents. And let me just really underline, small. It was insignificant, just enough to buy some sweets, if that's how I was so inclined. Now, one day, I went for a sleepover at one of my friend's houses, and I realized that he had something that I desperately wanted, actually, desperately needed. And that, of course, was the Nintendo 64 Super Smash Bros. game. So, when I went home later that day, excuse me, the next morning, I went to my piggy bank and I counted how many shillings I had. And that's not a weird reference to the Victorian era of England. We were living in Austria at the time, so shillings, of course, was the currency before the introduction of the euro. I, had, I counted my shillings, and it wasn't enough. So I went to my parents and said, I need a couple more shillings to buy this game. And they said, absolutely not. So I decided that I needed to be a little innovative. So I took my highest denomination of the shilling, I can't remember what that was, and I went to our photocopier in our house. I photocopied the bill. And then I photocopied the other side. And I managed to cut the sides, and I was quite proud of my work. And so I went to my dad and said, look, I can now buy my game. He wasn't too pleased about what I had done, so he tore up my hard work and said that this is the preserve of the Austrian government to print and, and publish all their money. That was the end of my little experiment. But that, of course, isn't unique to Austria. All governments around the world reserve the right to print their own currencies. And this, of course, is monopoly. We're often told that monopolies are bad, but governments reserve the right to monopolies all the time. That is also the same, for instance, the monopoly of the use of violence. Now, these places are never challenged because they reserve this right. So what we want to do today is to have a discussion about how we can effectively challenge monopolies and how to institute choices for us. So today's speaker is a VC investor, a lecturer, and a, a former CEO of three blockchain and disruptive technology consultancies here in London. He's lectured, lobbied, and worked with the United Nations, the European Parliament, MIT, LSC, 70 universities, and uh, organizations dealing with innovation and start-up companies. So it is without further ado that together with FinTech and Tech Society here at King's College London, that we get to introduce Julio Alejandro. Thank you. <laughs> voilà. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor to have the opportunity to present it here. And the key words that he mentioned are what we're gonna be exploring and talking in this, in this lecture. We often talk about monopolies as being a source of evil. We think about monopolies as the lack of competition, lack of opportunity, and lack of choice itself for us to choose different products, different services, different ideas, and different things that ameliorate our personal well-being and personal happiness. If we understand or if we believe that monopolies themselves are negative, why then do we provide the monopoly of the use of force and violence to government and to a centralized authority that eliminates the possibilities for us to have better and distinctive economic systems better and distinctive legal systems, better and distinctive governance systems, the way that we govern, that human relations are created, and that we do not have the opportunity to create better and alternative cities, communities, and organizations that are on a voluntary basis because of government controlling and stopping choice and innovation from entrepreneurs, and, and tech innovators. So this conversation would be about startups, but about startups that are working within the political fields of disruptive technologies. Those technologies such as blockchain, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, internet of things, smart cities, any tech or algorithmic startup. Those who create mathematics at the core front and with those mathematical, front, uh, with those mathematical models they build um, protocols. With those protocols, you build a startup or a company. And within those companies, you can start demonopolizing and denationalizing, 
taking the power away from the central government, from the central bank, and from the central constitutions, the legality that exists within us. So I'll be explaining, unfortunately, for whatever kind of reason, the videos are not, um, uh, are, you, you can, I think that you cannot hear the videos. This is Milton Friedman. <clears throat> Milton Friedman is one of the Chicago School of Economics, possibly Nobel Prize of Economics, written about 15 books about monetarism, and within his political ideas, they shape the idea, and in this video he explains how we could, the internet, in 1999, the internet will create a form of decentralization of all of the governance systems and would create one product that is called electronic cash. Electronic methods and forms of cash have existed for at least 50 or 60 years. Bitcoin is the most visible, Bitcoin is the most popular, but before Bitcoin, several examples existed that tried to take away the monopoly and try to create a new alternative economic system. So the best way, I've lectured in over 70 universities, institutions, the World Bank, the United Nations, the European Parliament, and I need to explain diverse audiences what is technology and what is technology impacts to society. I had to explain the shapes in Saudi Arabia, how would they be using artificial intelligence. I had to explain Bosniak and Serbian groups within their military conflicts, what could be the pros and the cons and the differences of using face recognition and different uh, credit scoring systems. And I had to go to Latin America, to Mexico, the country that I was born, and try to explain to people what, uh, how can technology solve problems of narco traffic, organized crime, and, 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 and the, the war against drugs that we have in Mexico. And the best method that I found so far is explaining them and beginning within the economic sense. It is the easiest and the most practical way of explaining what is decentralization means. Decentralization begins in the economic sense. We will see around 50, there's around 50 companies, 50 tech startups, uh, all of them creating different economic production currency, market, innovation, entrepreneurship within the economic grounds of the trading grounds. Uh, and as we progress, we'll see also how does the legal system operates. How does the government operate? And at the very, very end of it, I'll explain uh, part of the work that I'm having with some venture capital investors and, and, and how do I work within the economic sense, within the, the investment sense, uh, in building cities physical cities, territorial cities, like Shenzhen, like Dubai, like Hong Kong, how do we build cities using this disruptive technologies? Well, some three key things that I think that you should have in mind. Well, the economics is related to Bitcoin, the legal system is with smart contracts of Ethereum, the governance uh, largely with the, the, the centralized autonomous organizations, and territorial cities with startup societies or um, startup organizations that build countries themselves, city states, city nations as such. One of the key ingredients after giving so many talks and trying to explain such a diverse audience is that they lack of understanding the meaning of freedom. And what freedom and technology correlate is whenever you have the opportunity to choose. When you have the opportunity to choose, it suggests that there's a mechanism or a tool where you can make those choices. That tool is called a market. A market is where you bring different actors to interact and share ideas, share products, share services, buy and sell things, create things. A market is where you have the group of people that work in technology and economics working together. And for such, at the very end of it, I will explain what is the role with two other technologies, uh, transhumanism or hella cells, the biogenetic modification of the body, and I'll explain about general and super artificial intelligence, or AGI, how sometimes people call it.
these are some of the organizations that we'll be talking about. Um, all of these organizations, except of Alcor Foundation, the one all the way in there, and the second one in there, which is Eternity, are explicitly anti-government organizations. Meaning, they see government as the biggest threat to humanity. They don't think that liberal democracy is the way to move forward. They would understand human rights as a Canadian Marxist economic system. And they think that politicians and legislators and not the tech entrepreneurs should be the ones that are suffering because of their legislations like Uber uh, getting banned or most of the cryptocurrencies being attacked by the government or a lot of over-regulation, over-licensing, know your customer, anti-money laundering, uh, anti-terrorist laws that exist created by the, by, by, by the government institutions, by the FCA, by the Financial Conduct Authority in the United Kingdom, or by the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission in the United States. They believe that relations are not voluntary and that we should arrive to a world where relations are voluntary, like sex, or like trade, or like the way that we make friends, the way that we decide to buy an apple, or the way that we decide that we can drink alcohol. Our relation with the government, all of them would claim, except those two maybe, they're also anarchists, but they were not publicly willing to accept it, um, all of these organizations believe that your relation with the government is not voluntary. Meaning, for many of the people that are in here, I see very foreign faces, a lot of immigrants. I see a guy from, I think that guy has like five passports. I see some of my Mexican friends. I think they have a Georgian friend. I have many international friends. When they try to arrive into the UK, they face a visa restriction that does not allow the whole world or the whole people to interact, to create their own community, to live, to work, to do whatever the fuck they want. Meaning, the government uses violence to stopping you from immigrating from one place to another one. This relation with the government is not voluntary. The relation that women have in Saudi Arabia is not voluntary with the government, that homosexuals, that the Shia community, that any ethnic or religious group of people, they do not have a voluntary relation with whomever or whatever kind of government do they have. We do not agree within the economic system. And the best methods that we have to change society is usually through a liberal democracy that would make your life difficult and miserable. And it also assumes that we or you have the capacity to change or influence millions of people a hundred million people in the United States or 500 million people in China and India and that is extremely unrealistic and we should oppose and avoid democracy altogether. All of these organizations in case it's not evident and including myself, we're anti-democratic activists. We hate democracy. We oppose democracy. It's a cruel, evil, useless, counterproductive system of social organizations. Therefore, how do we understand it? I explained, or I would try to explain all of the topics, like what is demonopolization, denationalization, and decentralization, which is pretty much the same thing. Meaning we're taking away the power from the government and from the politicians and the bureaucrats and the diplomats and European Union and giving it back to the people. We're gonna understand what is foundational technologies. And this will be particularly necessary for those who work in disruptive tech. We talk about disruptive tech and venture capital and a cloud, blockchain, mobile first, uh, financial inclusion, whatever garbage of buzzwords that you can put into your startup to claim and to go with venture capitals and investors to create a startup and hopefully you would become rich and et cetera. Most of the times, technologies are not disruptive. Me as a personal expert on blockchain. I can assure you that in London, nine out of 10 blockchain companies are absolute garbage. They're hopeless. You can throw them to the trash. I would even think that 10 out of 10, there's nothing. In London wise, there's very few. And we would also understand why does science fiction usually creates economic theories 
and those economic theories create political technologies. This is, well, that's my company in there. It's Jada. Those are the companies that I manage. I'm sorry, the technologies that I create, build, innovate, design, sell. And this in here, it's, it's, it's one way that I explain the, the creation of, of technologies. When we're talking about all of the things in there, Bitcoin, biometrics, Internet of Things, virtual assistants, face recognition, etc., most of them are created first science fiction 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Then they create an academic theory. Then they have a group of intellectuals lecturing in these universities and, and publishing books and having peer reviews. And then eventually the technology exists. And once the technology exists, do they have money? Is there a group of people that are willing to pay to invest for this money? So to understand the future and to understand the centralization, we need to go back. We need to go back to, under to understand what are the origins of this. This is the broader picture. The modern technologies were created within the cybernetic era after Second World War. There were different books that were published. There were The Brave New World, Aldous Huxley, very famous, one of the most famous British families. His, his brother is one of the founders of UNESCO. George Orwell uh, with 1984, having a dystopian, panoptic society where everything would be surveilled and we wouldn't have no privacy. And with no privacy, we cannot think. If there's no thing we cannot create, if we don't think and create, there's no one that is going to invest in us. So it's a really negative world that we have. And then a, a famous politician, one of the most famous diplomats, American diplomats, he wrote in 1970s, between two ages, America's role in the tectronic era. Um, Brzezinski, he explained that we were going to see the separation between extremely illiterate and poor developed countries people and extremely smart people in the other sense. And these smart people are going to be connected to government and government are going to control the whole society and the whole population against their will and against their capacity even to think or to create anything. From this dystopian world you created there was a lot of novels, a lot of narratives, a lot of poetry a lot of science fiction. And some of that previous science fiction were called the cyberpunks with a B. Desde Grupo. B. Cyberpunks. And they wrote William Gibson, American, American Canadian, very famous essayist. Uh, they explained how could technology help to solve this problem if technology goes good or if technology goes bad. And then there were two large schools of thought that they never really met until modern era. You had a group of economists all the way up. You have Friedrich Hayek, Nobel Prize of Economics, possibly the most important and famous economist in the world. And you have David Friedman, the son of Milton Friedman, also Nobel Prize of Economics, that wrote two books. I'll be explaining more about them. But they talk about denationalizing things in the 1970s, 73 and 76. They write these two books explaining people how and why are we going to create, are we going to separate the power of government using only theory. And this group of people, the Bitcoin cypherpunks with a PH, that's a PH in there, and that's a B in there. Um, from the 1983 or 1980s until approximately 2008, they created a lot of anti-government tools. Those anti-government, and I'm not saying, well, we might have a better and more democratic system. No, there are explicitly three characteristics. They're crypto anarchists, they're anarcho capitalists, and some of them are objectivists, to please my friends. Those groups of people, they created these technologies to protect themselves against a panoptic surveillance global state. They believe that only through privacy or encryption and encryption apps 
would you be able to create better systems to protect yourself against the tectronic era and 1984 and the surveillance ideas? So the surveillance people, the privacy mathematicians and techs and startups from the 1980s and 1990s from San Francisco, they met the political economists, the theorists, they matched together, they went with themselves together, and they began creating technologies. Some of the political technologies and parties organizations that were created, most of them you would recognize them, or at least have heard of many of them. The Pirate Party, WikiLeaks, Anonymous, uh, the PGP Wars uh, with, with Phil Zimmerman, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, most of them based in California. This kind of political technologies brought and were created by this group of people. And this group of people, apart from being a group of people, an ecosystem, they're an ideology, they're a philosophy, they're a way of thinking. The cypherpunks, with a PH, are the group of people disproportionately American, 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 we don't know, American, American as well, Australian, and British. But all of them were based within the American principles and the American Revolution, the bills of rights, of stopping and of having limited government. Having limited government and having inalienable rights. God gave us the possibility for organizing ourselves and to fight against the government, to fight against the state and anyone that tries to eliminate our God-given rights. Li rights to life, to liberty, and to property. And as such, we can begin explaining how to create a decentralized economy using startups. This would be the startups, but you need to understand this first. As I mentioned before, generally speaking, you have a group of science, fiction, philosophers, utopists, poets, crazy people that they don't shower in a month, and they just write books for the sake of writing those books. They write political manifestos, and as such, they eventually met Hayek. And that, that book is the origin of modern Bitcoin. Modern Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, Monero. And the Monero, it's called denationalization of money. He thought, why couldn't we, and why couldn't the cryptocurrency world provide a bet, uh, why, can, why can this cryptocurrency world, or this group of people, provide um, power for private institutions to create money instead of the central bank. Here in the UK, you have the Bank of England, and the Bank of England itself needs to publish the money, it needs to print the money. The fiscal, the monetary, and the financial tools are all concentrated within one government. That is a large problem because if you disagree in the way that the economic and the production world operates, there's nothing that you can do about it. Eventually, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote the white paper of Bitcoin in 2008, and Libra became the first example of a company challenging, to a certain extent, the monopoly of the creation of money, of currency, and of value against uh, the state. So the question is here. If government is such a group of useless, stupid, hopeless people, why do they have the monopoly and the creation of money, of currency, of a medium of transaction, of a store of value, of a unit of account, whatever you call it? Why do they have the monopoly, and why don't we give an, an opportunity so multiple and even opposing private organizations create money? Not the Bank of England, not their economists, not the cultural Marxist connections that exist in those organizations, but have a market. Have a market so universities like King's College, London School of Economics, Imperial College, UCL, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they create their own money. 
And how are we going to know if Princeton is better than Harvard or if Oxford is better than Cambridge? Well, there's going to be hard competition. And in the market, they would be able, and we will be able to see how and why we'd be able to create a better economic system. If Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch are more, more of a moral organizations that can provide better economic incentives to ameliorate poverty and to take people out of poverty through the redistribution, through training, through risk management, why does the Bank of England has a monopoly in it? Why don't we give a company like Apple to fight against Microsoft and against Sony? Whole Foods to fight against Walmart and to fight against um, Tesco and to fight against Amazon and all of the banking institutions to provide their own money. HSBC would be fighting against Bank of America and American Express. Denationalization of money, as that book says in there, 1976 by Frederick Hayek, means that all of this and more organizations that you can think of would openly create and participate in, a, in an exchange to see who has and can create the better economic system. Blockchain, of course, is a technology that allows an opportunity to decentralize, identify, match, correlate, create open source, and all of the innovations behind it. But what matters nowadays is that very few people are thinking about this except Facebook. Facebook is the only one that decided to launch a virtual currency, a virtual token, something that does not have a medium of exchange. But if we think about the people in India, in Latin America, in Peru, in useless countries in Central Asia, in China, in very oppressive societies, having access from exiting and not using the Argentinian peso or the Romanian leo or the Soviet whatever money that they have in there, and trusting Oxford or McKinsey or Deloitte, which one do you think that those people in Argentina, where they have financial crisis, which money would they use? This is the nationalization. You create opportunities so international companies and organizations as such create money, and people from Argentina and from Greece, they don't starve to death. You create the nationalized markets. These are some examples of the previous cryptocurrencies, and I'll explain about the market in a second. But just look about the titles. Big Brother Obsolete, David Chum, 1982. This is the creation of Monero. B Money is the creation of Bitcoin before hands. Government is not temporarily destroyed, but permanently forbidden and permanently unnecessary. It's, it's a community where the threat of violence is important because violence is impossible. And violence is impossible because its participant cannot be linked, cannot be traced, cannot be recognized. They use encryption to stop and unlink the, the, their true names or physical locations. Read the first part that he says in there. I am fascinated by Team A's crypto anarchy. All of this group of people, not all of them, but most of them, most of the early creators of all these technologies were anarcho-capitalists or crypto-anarchists. When you hear someone in blockchain saying that we need a little bit of regulation, immediately you understand that he doesn't understand blockchain, or he doesn't understand the history of blockchain. Be called with Nick Sabbath if when he matched money with law, and money with law beat, beat gold with smart contracts, smart contracts were first quoted in 1997, explain such. These are the books behind it, but it's a little bit problematic. So who thinks about, who creates these ideas? These ideas are all marvelous. Where did they come from? Largely from economists. There's four schools of thoughts in economics. You have the Marxist, the Canadians, the Monetarist, or Chicago ones, and the Austrians. Even at the Chicago ones, this two, wait, wait, okay, this two, I'm Chinese, this, <laughs> this two in here, 
the, the Marxists and the Canadians are perennially useless and they can never and will never create anything. So the debate is, can the Chicago Milton Friedman and Gary Becker create any competition against the Austrian School of Economics? Even if they're both neoliberal and capitalist free markets, the answer is no. The answer is that sadly, Milt, uh, Milton Friedman, Gary Becker, and, and the people from Chicago, they never truly created many things that advanced the creation of disruptive technologies. On the technological sense, most of the people that understand Bitcoin and value were referred to the Austrian School of Economics. And the Austrian School of Economics, you at least can see the M in there. Yes, it's from Austria, very important. But he created the idea since 1929, this is 1929, that one of the people working with Ludwig von Mises, Ludwig von Mises from Austria, from the Austrian Empire, actually proposed a currency based on electricity. Since the 1920s, even before the recession of the United States, people and the Austrian economies were thinking, how can we take the power away from the government and the, the centralized banks? How can we eliminate all of those useless legislations and regulations? This is in 1929, he created this. And Hayek, in that sense, created a similar thing. In The Economist, the magazine here in London, there's one area that is called Schumpeter. And Schumpeter explains about creative destructions. And creative destruction is you, create, you destroy something to innovate and build something better. And those are the foundations of the economic system that allows all of these technologies first to be created and to flourish, and B, the ideological mindset, the axiology, the motivation of people of why should we create something? What is the reason for us to create a startup? We create a, a startup and, a, and we're entrepreneurs and we're building a technology for what? For which purpose? For which moral purpose? For which economic purpose? What is the reason behind it? Will be better understand if people understand Hayek, Schumpeter, Menger, and, the, and von Mises. How do you demonopolize laws? The biggest and most visible thing, and the, the biggest criticism against anarcho capitalism, is that if everyone has their different law, and in my law it's legal to kill you, and in his law it's legal to steal money, well, it's their own independent laws. How do we create a system of market competition eliminating the Magna Carta, the American Constitution, the Mexican, the Nigerian, the Chinese Constitution? How do we provide individual laws so every member in the public, in the audience, have their own law? I would explain this in a, I think that he's smarter than me to explain it. Uh, definitely more capable and visible, but he talks in here about the book, The Machinery of Freedom. So how could you have a society in which the fundamental functions were produced uh, privately rather than by government? And let me start with what it, so I want to imagine a society where individuals hire private firms to protect their rights and settle their disputes with other individuals. The same. He keeps talking about right enforcement agencies. How do you create private enforcement agencies so everyone, instead of having the British police or the American police, where if you're Mexican, black, Muslim, or any person of color would be quite miserable and indesirable, how do we fix this? And the way of fixing it, according to anarcho-capitalism, and David Friedman, Marvin Rothbard, and the Mises Institute, is by creating private right enforcement agencies, as it's explained in here. And again, a short history of private law on how do you provide, privatize the law. Uh, Robert Hanley, 1966, he wrote a very famous uh, book, novel, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And he explains in this science fiction methodology and crazy narratives, how do humans have everyone in, 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 in Earth and not in the moon, people in Earth they have national laws. 
So as we can go to a bar and decide which kind of alcohol do we want to have, if we want to have a beer, a gin, a gin tonic, if we want to have a double, if we want to have a triple, if we want to have a large one, if we want to have a coffee or a tea, we have choice in a bar, but we don't have choice in the creation of laws. And that very simple and, and dumb idea that he was talking in science fiction was the motivation for David Friedman to create the machinery of freedom. Part of what we saw in, in, in private enforcement agencies. And with those private enforcement agencies, Nick Savile in 1997 created the idea of the generation of a smart contract. And a smart contract with many pros and cons has a lot of problems in, the, in, 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 in functionality in the physical world. But what they do basically is that once a certain group of characteristics are met, money would be transferred from one place to the other. We might need oracles to validate what's happening in the real world. We might need to know what exactly, who won the competition between Mexico the US, against the US playing soccer, and if the real uh, uh, outcome was one to zero, or two to one, or three to three against one. Who won the elections? Is it real that Jeremy Corbyn beat uh, the liberal Democrats and the conservatives? How do we validate what is the truth? And on this, did an airplane arrive in time? Or was it 15 minutes late? Because if you use EasyJet or Ryanair, they claim that they were not two hours and 50 minutes or six hours and 50 minutes. They were just five hours and 59 minutes and therefore they will not pay you compensation. Or they were overbook your flights and you have a problem because there is not a single um, Way, there's not a multiple ways of validating what is the truth. And from 1997 to 2014, it was the creation of Ethereum. I'll, 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 I'll say a thing. Yeah, Vinay Gupta is one of the creators and founders of Ethereum. Uh, myself, I participated in Eternity until last year, one of the biggest competitors. I also have some skin in the game. But this is how it works. So this is how it works in the startups that are creating legal systems for every individual because monopolies are bad and because you should be able to choose. Many of this, Ulex, a uh, very famous one by Petra Friedman, a group of Americans and Germans that are creating an open source legal system. An open source legal system that exists in Dubai, but it also exists in places like Kazakhstan, in a fintech village, in a fintech community where they say, well, Kazakhstan constitution and legal system is really, it's extremely corrupt, it's extremely stupid, it's very inefficient, it doesn't provide trust for investors and entrepreneurs and startups. So the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna download, as if it would be an app, we're gonna be downloading the legal system to adapt it into the region, special economic, special governance zone of a tech park in, um, Kazakhstan, we see big nation, we see civic in terms of a digital identity. We have protocols that are semi-private or entirely private like Eternity. And we have the centralized autonomous organizations to basic, I don't know, the one all the way in, in, in the north. I met Luis just last week, the CEO. And what they, what they create is that they can create any kind of human organizations without a head, without a centralized plan, without a physical person that is operating the ideas. This kind of DAOs are great because it allows you to have a corporation without a CEO. It allows you to have IBM, McKinsey, Coca-Cola, Walmart, any private company without a board of directors. You democratize you decentralize the decision making from 20 people to as many shareholders or token holders that can vote in favor or against the decision of a pool of money. And it can also create a government um, governance without government. It can allow you to have taxation without politicians. That would be great. Meaning, we eliminate the physical politicians, the British parliament, the courts, hopefully all politi political parties, 
And then we, through the use of smart contracts and a DAO, we say, if the people, if this company picks up the trash from that, my neighborhood, he would receive money. So, if the children from this universe, from this school in Angel or in Old Street, uh, accepts 20 children, immediately the money would go to this school. If any way that you need to verify that people are creating something, and that creation of something involves lack of transparency, a lot of inefficiency, corruption, and mismanagement, a smart contract and a DAO automates when certain characteristics are met, the money will be sent. If you lie, or if you fail in completing certain tasks, <coughs> the money will not be sent to the politicians. So it's a good way to starve the government, or to force politicians actually to create the things that they promise in their electoral campaign. If Jeremy Corbyn claims that he can decrease the inflation by 5% in five months, have skin in the game. Put your money where your mouth is. Have a responsibility. Take action for it. A DAO like Oregon allows you to have the systems. If you do not lower by 5% in five months, Jeremy Corbyn does not get paid and the Labor Party does not get paid. If the Liberal Democrats do not achieve the goal of stopping Brexit or of helping European immigrants to legally stay and, and quickly, efficiently stay in Europe, all the money is sent back to their originators. That is what a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization is. I'll talk a little bit about one of them that, I'm, uh, that, I, that I work in, um, BitNation. BitNation is quite famous because we're very loud. Uh, we brought some group of people in here, Vinay Gupta, that is all the way in the back, David Orban, the creator of the um, Swedish Pirate Party, the creator of Liberland, the president of the Transhumanist Society, and uh, I have no idea what I'm doing in there, but you know, they, they, they think that I have something worth to say, so they kind of like put me in there. So on a practical way, how, how would it operate? What do we mean, like we're gonna decentralize and take the power of government in, into whom? Meaning, if I have a children, where, 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 the freak, where, where the hell am I going to register the children if there's no government? All of those things of creating a marriage, of owning a house or a title, whenever people have a dispute resolution, the birth certificates of your children, the wills when you die, peer-to-peer -peer immediate security, meaning business corporations that create private police between them. Business and corporations, residents, where do you live? And if you live in a place, do you have universal basic income? Trade agreements, resource allocation, and healthcare. All of that could exist within a distributed database without the use of bureaucrats and government organizations. This decentralized, borderless, voluntary nation, as it says in there, operates on codes of law, but more importantly, they create red identity, a digital identity. How do you create a digital identity? There's many ways. I like this one in particular. This one by BitNation, it's, clay, it's an AI system called Lucy, and it has three proofs. Proof of agreement, of nomic, and of collective. And those digital identities would be tokens that are not transferable. Meaning, whenever you register, whenever you create an action, whenever I give a lecture in here, or whenever we drink a, a, a drink in, in the pub, or whenever you sign up in Eventbrite to come in here, and whenever you say that you're gonna stay for the whole length of the lecture, uh, if it lasts an hour or two hours, that is an action. How do we validate that you legitimately created those actions? If I ask my friend to take 20 pictures and he comes but doesn't take the 20 pictures, he didn't fulfill his commitment. If I ask my friend to owe me or to send me 
$20 or $100, and he fails to do so by Friday, he failed his commitment. So by having digital identity and the reputation, it is a proof of instead of change the word agreement and just put the word contract. We created a contract. Once we establish that contract, if you fulfill that contract, we move forward. You have good checks. If that exists within a collective, not one group of people, but many people, it increases. And the nomic is for people that actually create a marketplace of loss. Meaning, if we have a dispute because I ask you to, to take 20 pictures and you only send me 19 or 16 pictures, you failed, you, you breached an agreement. You failed. You're lying to me. You, you didn't give it in here. So if there's no government with whom, what's the court system that I go to them and say like, hey, he told me that he was going to send me 20 pictures. I paid him, and he ripped me off. Well, there needs to be a marketplace so lawyers create their own loss, and those laws themselves are better than the actual ones because they're voluntary and contractual. We can choose the legal system because other people are creating that legal system, and there's an incentive so lawyers and legislators create better legal systems for us. The monopolization of governance. This is a little bit more interesting, not sure, more complicated. I have more complicated things to say, don't worry, at the end. Um, but how do you demonopolize the use of violence, the use of force? How do you create things that involve visa immigration? How do we bring more people into this country? Try that. Try going with someone from Afghanistan or Syria or Venezuela or North Korea or Saudi Arabia and tell them, hey, dude, you can just move to the UK. Can they do that? No. Can most immigrants just emigrate to the UK? No. Do we want to change that? I hope that yes. Should we start taking the government as a criminal organization that does not allow to bring our friends into here? I think yes as well. Uh, but most importantly, who's doing this and how to, you know, how to say these things? Again, very miserable. We couldn't do it. Uh, this is one of the territories that are being created. Um, this is a house in the middle of, of the ocean in Thailand that was established in February this year. Those are the two guys. It's an American and a Thai, an American guy and a Thailandese woman called Bitcoin Girl. Those are called Seasteads. And the Seastead cost around 200,000 pounds or dollars. And you can just simply put them in the middle of the ocean and have your everyday living in there using solar electricity, autonomous re renewable electricity. And this couple decided to create their own. And they decided to create ocean builders. Meaning everything is sound, is, is cool and amazing until you actually see physical things happening. This is one of them. There's around 10 uh, companies that built these physical things. The infrastructure, the, the muscle, the, the, the plastics. And they're trying to recreate this across the world. Restore the environment, so help the climate change. Enrich the poor, because you get them out of useless places like Syria or Mexico. Cure the sick, because it creates pharmaceutical incentives for companies. And liberate humanity from politicians, which is pretty much everything that we've been saying from the beginning. So I, I've worked with many of these organizations. 
I tried to help them. I tried to be nice with them. Um, none of them has evolved anywhere. None of it has significantly created anything but a PowerPoint presentation and a lot of lectures and media. They go into New York Times, and these guys, they publish an article every week, whatever they want to, and they claim that they're creating something, and they have the good mentality, and they are the only group of people that are creating it, but they're failing. And they're failing for a number of reasons, but the most important is that this idea, which is called Liverland, this is between, in the Danube River, between Serbia and, and uh, Croatia. Serbia, Croatia, yes, yeah, Serbia, Croatia, and Hungary. They're trying to create in seven, a seven square mile, a country. It is not secession. They're simply trying to create a libertarian utopia for technologists, investors, tech entrepreneurs, startups, and crazy people. And it would be a tax haven, but it would also have a lot of benefits for creating your own um, life as long as you're not harming anyone. Um, they failed, and they failed largely, or they're failing largely for a few reasons. One of the most important ones, there's like 20 of these ones, by the way. Like, I just choose, uh, I'll, I'll put the next one. Uh -huh. This is another project, an interesting project, because it got something like $300 million. I'm not sure about the, the, the exact um, amount of money. But to create this in the desert of Nevada, um, close to Reno, the capital. So this territory in here um, was launched or was explained, I think, last year in DEF CON in Prague, if I'm not mistaken. And they explained that they need the help of libertarians and everyone who believes in these ideas, everyone who works in blockchain, artificial intelligence, etc., to move into here and to help to build a city to help it build a city that would have certain legislations that would be different from the United States. Would this be possible? I don't think so. But if you think, or if you go a little bit back into, where are you? Hmm, forgot to put them in there. But the Free, St Free State Project in New Hampshire, those guys got around 3,000 libertarians and technologists moving into the state of New Hampshire next to Massachusetts, you have Boston in here, and then an hour away, you have the state of New Hampshire in, um, in the ancient colonies, and they moved 3,000 people uh, to have a political say and also to defend themselves against government. Uh, it's an open care state, it's a semi-open care state, uh, but people are allowed freely and openly to carry weapons, I think, well, this is very controversial because Europeans, in my opinion, are not able to understand freedom. Freedom means the, the necessity of self-protecting yourself. If you are black in the United States, I think that you need to protect yourself against the police. If you are an undocumented immigrant, a Mexican or Salvadorian immigrant, I, need to, you, I think you need to protect yourself against uh, the American government, ICE and, and, and DHS. And if you're Muslim and they're just targeting because of your religion I don't find, or your skin color, I don't think or I don't see how would that be acceptable under any circumstances. So the Second Amendment and the Bill of Rights are created to protect yourself from government. And as such, these organizations explicitly need the use of, 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 of military-grade weapons to protect yourself against the government, more or less like Hong Kong would, would ideally want to have in this sense. There's, um, there's a use also of, of, of artificial intelligence, 3D printers, artificial intelligence, 3D printers, and um, transhumanism. Um, and I find them extremely fascinating, but on a realistic way, almost everyone that works in this kind of ecosystem is related to blockchain, cyberpunks, cryptocurrencies. Not the IBM useless people but the Monero, Bitcoin people. Those people are creating almost everything that I mentioned before. Even Defense Distributed, which is 3D printed guns by Cody Wilson. He started it five, six years ago in Austin, Texas. Then he got mocked by the US authorities, but he has a system extraction. Mm -hmm. So you have a 3D printer, you have a printer, and that 3D printer has materials, and it does something like this, and it builds, parts of a gun. 
If you could have this anywhere else in the world, basically you could break from freedom, free from internal milk. You still need to buy many tanks in Europe, which you, you, you wouldn't be able to find it on the legal market at least. But it's one of the opportunities and what's one of the explanations that Cody Wilson, using this American mentality of the American Revolution founding fathers, that he had and that he thinks that people need to protect themselves against the government and against the state. The use of artificial intelligence, Peter Thiel calls it communist and Marxist, and I'm not sure if he called it fascist, but he was very close. Peter Thiel, the, the CEO, the former CEO of PayPal and the first investor in, in, in Facebook, uh, usually explains technology against decentralization against centralization. And decentralization is the cryptocurrencies, everything that I mentioned in, in this talk, the Bitcoin people without the idea. And the, the, the centralization, he calls it data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, etc. And within artificial intelligence, there's, there's a strong debate about how and why should we regulate it under which conditions? Uh, so we stop a uh, dystopia of creating an, an extraterrestrial organism to create energy and systems that can be unstopped and that they can be uh, not benign, but malign. So how do we start this? That again is based on Canadianism. Artificial intelligence is Canadianism and Marxism. Cryptocurrency is Austrian School of Economics. This group of people believe that they have the moral right to stop a developer and a mathematician and an algorithm creator to stop him from creating something. And it's the debate about ethics. What is the ethics of artificial intelligence? Should artificial intelligence do this or that? Will we achieve singularity by, 19, by 2045? Would we create this and this and this and this and this? Maybe or maybe not. They do not believe, they believe that they need to bring the best and most qualified group of people into, the, into a room, and they themselves have the right to control artificial intelligence. So for that, there's a very cool organization called Pandora Box Chain, and it's by a group of Ukrainians. Uh, many of those Ukrainians were, lived on their, or their, their family died on their Holomov, under the Stalinate um, centralization of plan, and they believe that it's a terrible idea that any government or corporation should control artificial intelligence. They have a whole list explaining it, what they call the Free AI Manifesto, which I have it here, by the way, uh, and it's a set of explanation and priorities why you should not control it. Also something very interesting about AI ML is that the conversations are quite civil. When I go to Cambridge or United Nations for those people, most of the conversations are by academics and scientists and et cetera. Meaning very calm, very academic, very professional. And in a cryptocurrency conference, the one the people that went to the blockchain conference in just like a month ago, like a woman stood up and started shouting against, against Satoshi and Craig Wright, and, and it's, it's this group of people, Bitcoin people, are more emotional and more political and less tolerant towards the academic passivity that exists. And the third and, and equal important is transhumanism. And transhumanism, I don't see it that it can or has uh, a strong potential, largely out of ignorance, I think. I would like to learn more. But I don't think that it has a strong potential to denationalize or demonopolize many things. What I think it has the potential is within the hella cells to be immortal, to rejuvenate, to install them and rejuvenate your, your body. And as such, what um, David Wood and Jose Cordero call killing the death. It's a very famous book that is called La Muerte de la Muerte, the death of the death. How do you kill death so we become immortal? Not only immortal at the age of 60, 70, and 80 years old, but we rejuvenate. We became younger and healthier and stronger. So that idea that you can live forever and be immortal, 
would put political pressure within the systems that stop liberty from flourishing. Because a person from Syria or Afghanistan or North Korea, he might be very sad and miserable, but he knows that he might die by the age of 60, 70, or 90 years old. But if he knows, and if we know that someone from Syria or from North Korea is going to live until the age of 200 or 500 years old, maybe that person from Syria will not accept the nationality of being Syrian, the identity of being Syrian, neither the laws and the policies that exist in Syria or Saudi Arabia. So that would create political pressure. That would eliminate also, I hope and I pray, the nation states and all of these ideologies and the institutions that exist. And social evolution is just a welfare state that if I would have more time, I would explain. But I think I'm running out of time and I'll Mm. Voila. So if we could cut the video here, thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'll take a few questions. I don't think that they have an alternative agenda. I think that they create um, a mindset and it shows people that private companies can also create money. Before Bitcoin, the biggest contribution of, of Bitcoin has been that people start questioning what is, what is the origin of money? What, what creates money? Who creates money? And why do they create money? What is money? So a private company like Libra, even if it's centralized, even if it's a virtual and it's not, not really a currency, even if it has no medium of exchanging and, and, and buying or selling things in, in a coffee shop or in Starbucks and in Burger King, it, it really creates an opportunity for people to start thinking of this and of be creating this, this kind of similar products. When something is a monopoly, it's good. Um, it's very good. People should be creating monopolies. I do not listen to anyone, any startup that is not a monopoly. <laughs> because you're just building something, you're copy pasting Chinese model, something that sounds similar, looks similar, and you claim that it's different, but most of the things in here, I hope and pray that many of you guys have never heard before, that are totally alien for you. And, and, and if you can start thinking outside of this and understand that you can create outside of government some way in however Libra is middle doing, it's, it's entirely desirable. It's, it's a very good option and, and, and I think that we should support it. I think, I think it's a great model, if you ask me. Um, and most importantly, that what are the pros and cons in this? Our first question is, is it voluntary? Meaning, can you opt out if you don't like it? Can you refuse to have it? I refuse to leave the UK, but they might kick me out because of my immigration visa, or you or this guy. I, I, I refuse that if I have weed or, or cocaine or any weed to go to prison, but they would still send me for that. Uh, Alan Turing and across the world, they criminalize homosexuality and they have laws against women. I think that women should rebel against those laws, if you ask me, and that we should explicitly be violating those laws. Uh, so Libra, it's not important if it's what's the economic model, what's the small parts of it. What matters is that there's one large corporation standing up against government and giving choice for people in Nigeria, Georgia, Honduras, and Syria that, have, that their money disappears eventually. Once we stop having Facebook, and we have Facebook, and then Microsoft, and then all of these organizations that I previously mentioned, that is when we, we, we achieve real freedom. Um, once we have all of this liberalized the first, by 2025 or 2030 or whatever, we want King's College to actually be creating this, this cryptocurrencies or mechanisms of, of exchange of money and value. And that is what is important. So we should promote that a company has the guts to challenge and to create something new and, and different.
Maybe I missed when you talked about the implementation of individual companies, organizations creating their own cryptocurrencies. With the experience that we currently have with the big one, which is uh, Bitcoin, of course, is, uh, this isn't a viable uh, financial system because you never know what you will have day to day with when you purchase a Bitcoin. So how would you imagine this would be strategically implemented? Um, I have my own solutions, which is called SDOs and, and stable coins. Stablecoin operates about bringing a very big whale and that stabilizes the prices. So we have uh, Bill Gates coin and if the price of a coin goes lower or higher, he puts 5 million in or takes 20 million out. And therefore the price of a coin would remain constant uh, at the price of one, one American dollar for one uh, uh, Bill Gates coin. And that would always be 0.99 or 1.01, .01, meaning it would vary 1%, maybe 2% at certain times, but the inflation rate would be quite um, accustomed and, and, and well, well produced. The reason that I didn't talk about stable coins is because it's part of what people call DeFi or decentralized finance, which if you're regulated by the government, you're not decentralized by any standards or chance or anything. And that eliminates almost every single organization who calls themselves decentralized. Maybe except Bitcoin and Dash and maybe Ethereum. I don't think Ethereum, but generally speaking, everyone that uses the word decentralized, they have no idea what they're talking about. And therefore, the, the real answer is, do we believe that the market, if there's a problem, who is going to solve this? There's instability of the price of Bitcoin being now 10,000 and tomorrow it's 12,000 and then it drops and then it goes up again. So you cannot have a business using cryptocurrencies. No one has or should have a business using cryptocurrencies. Um, the solution for that is what Friedrich Hayek calls spontaneous order. Meaning when people find the problem, they would naturally and organically find the institutions and means to solve it. English language or uh, the market as a process was not created by an individual. Common law was not created by a group of 20 people. It evolves. It sees a problem, it adapts. But there's not a central authority of experts or government or, or, or group of people or central planners that solve this kind of problems. Things naturally, naturally and organically flourish and flow to create, to solve problems that exist in society, if society realistically thinks that it needs to be solved. And the word stablecoin did not exist three years ago. Maybe it did, I'm not sure. But no one, not many people were creating stablecoins. But once it reached a certain problem of companies receiving so much money and saying, my money is going up and down, inflation rates are extreme, people naturally solve that problem. And if you trust markets, is trusting people. If you trust that people can solve natural problems, you don't need to have a group of academic experts and government bureaucrats solving or trying to infer with things in the world. Another question? Um, maybe just to finish this, but just the idea of downloadable law systems not contradict uh, the cyber fund. Uh, my second question is, you were talking a bit about welfare state and uh, universal basic income, uh, but does that not sound very much as kind of formulating that question like that? Okay. So universal basic income is, um, depends who takes it. I, I'm a little bit in favor of it, and I'm an anarcho-capitalist, crypto-anarchist, etc. cetera, uh, because I think that people have a moral responsibility within others. The objectivists don't, Ayn Rand and Jaron Brook doesn't, but uh, there's a group of people that are absolutely vulnerable in society, uh, especially babies, children, pregnant women, students in their student time, and also elderly and people who are, have a physical malfunction. They're blind, or they don't have a leg or an arm, and cannot provide for themselves. So I don't think it's a moral way for a society to let them on a less is fair uh, way of abandoning and say, okay, that baby, if, if you find a baby in the trash, that's the allegory, uh, who takes care of it? 
I think the solution would be to find it in, to solve the problem on the most immediate scale, on the family, on the friends, on the neighborhood, then on the community, the religious institutions, then I'm just exaggerating, I'm going all over the top, but the city state, then the state as Texas or California, and then the United States. So we, do we localize or do we federalize? Do we have a European Union, which is the worst thing in this planet, or do we have small local government uh, that could be the, the, go the local government of, um, of, of London or the local government of a street? So I think UBI, universal income, if it's voluntary and if it's on a, on a, on a local scale, I think it's better. Um, and on the second question about open source laws contradicting cypherpunks, maybe yes. Um, well, the cypherpunks were uh, mathematicians, legal experts, encryption uh, that used to send each other thousands of emails, usually based in San Francisco, trying to imagine a better society without surveillance. So. Among all of the legal systems, among the worst ones is the Napoleonic French one. I mean, Sharia law is, is like, like really bad, but the, the, the mainstream ones, the, the French one is, is, is horrible. It's how Latin America and many Middle Eastern countries were created. Um, a, a legal system, especially the American one, and, and I'm very critical of the United States, and it's a group of racist white supremacists, but is, is the best legal system that has worst being executed. The execution is awful, it's terrible, it, it created slavery, it's, it's, it's horrible. But the idea that you have inalienable rights where people cannot affect you, a democracy cannot affect you, and you have the right to protect yourself from that democracy would have stopped many genocides in Europe. Another question? Yeah? Yeah, so I, I think we'll end it there. But thank you for your okay. great talk, and uh, thank you all for coming. We're going to the pub. And uh, we're going to the pub afterwards. So if you want to join us, feel free to talk and discuss. We're, we're going to go to the to the George at LSE, London School of Economics, and they have three pubs. One of them is called the George. Uh, so we're going to be a few of us. If anyone wants to join us, uh, we'll continue the conversation in there. So thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks again. Thank you very much. <laughs>